Hi there. We are so glad you joined us today for this message. We hope you enjoy it. Kick back, learn about Jesus, and be blessed. Talk to you soon. All right, then. We'll get started. Um, so, Father's Day. Yeah, you kids can uh, go uh, and enjoy yourselves. Good things for the kids. All right. Well, what what uh, does anybody have a dad joke? Since it's Father's Day, no. Does everybody hate dad jokes? <laughs> No. <clears throat> Why is the Incredible Hulk so good at gardening? Because he had a green thumb. There you go. <clears throat> yeah. What kind of music does boulders like? Well, there you go. See, you guys got this already, right? <clears throat> uh, why did the elephant quit his job? He was working for peanuts. What did the teddy bear say when they asked him if he wanted dessert? I'm stuffed already. Yeah. Why did the banana not come to church? He wasn't peeling well. I mean, I can go on. I can go on and on and on. Yeah. I can go on and on. All right, well, we are at the end of Matthew, but we're not going to finish today. We're going to take uh, eight verses and look at those. And it said, what did it say? The greatest gift ever? Okay, well, that's a little different than what I wrote down for it to be, but... uh, yeah, that's not what I wrote on my paper, but but that'll be correct, right? It's supposed to be the greatest news ever, but it is also at the same time the greatest gift ever. And uh, as we look at 28 here, and uh, I'll just start reading it, verse 1, Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at the dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolling, uh, going to the tomb and rolling back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead. The angel said to the woman, Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. They ran to tell the disciples. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the fathers, Lord. We thank you for everything that you put into our life that blesses us. And we just ask that we would be able to use this word and uh, enlarge our trust and grow our spirits, Lord, towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, this seems like, you know, we've all heard this story. We've been heard it told a lot of times, I'm sure, and uh, lots of things go on with it. But there's, 
There's four different aspects of this that I want to get into that I want to talk about. Uh, ways that we can see this story or reasons why it can happen. Uh, in this is, as I was telling Deborah this morning, I said, well, when I, find, when I finally put all this down and my thoughts together and started writing it this morning, uh, this is, seems like not a message for Father's Day at all. So, bear with me. Uh, and, and we don't do the traditional holiday messages on whatever they are. If that was true, we'd have to be here on Monday for Juneteenth, right? So, <clears throat> so uh, we, uh, we don't do that, but here as we get into this, this is a, a, a celebration that we are going to have, and I want you guys to carry this with you throughout the week. As we go about the things of the Lord, think about uh, this glorious time. And one of the things that, that I've come to understand, yeah, I'm having a hard time with this thing. I've, I've come to understand this. I see people, uh, yes, we have to get back to the cross. We have to take people to the cross. And in life situations, we have to go to the cross. But we can't forget the tomb. We should be raising our hands and worshiping at the empty tomb. We should spend more time at the tomb than we do the cross as we get older in, in our faith and as we become Christians walking that out. Just my that's my opinion. I'll that's a, I'll leave it there. So uh, try to frame this out. I want to I want to say that this first part of this it says after the Sabbath at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And uh, I want to point out that in Matthew 27, just going back a little bit, first reason why I think they were used is because they, uh, well, guys, if you're sitting next to your wife, you might want to move a chair away. So you don't get an elbow. And don't throw anything at me. Okay? All right. So God used the weak. Right? And, uh, and so I want to go through that a little bit because that sometimes gets mis misconstrued and, and, and doesn't feel right when we say it because of what this world wants you to think weak is. And, uh, so, in Peter, First Peter, chapter three, verse seven, it says, "Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wife; treat them with respect, as the weaker partner, and as an heir with you." of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Um, and that's one thing that we don't want is something to hinder our prayers. Amen? And uh, it is something that very easily can be done. So, as he says this, the weaker partner, uh, as we come across this a lot of times, it's, it's put in a place where uh, you're not, men are superior and women are lesser. That's not the case. Uh, there was a, uh, a man who went to uh, the library and he said, uh, can, can you, and the librarian was sitting there, and he said, ma'am, can you tell me where the book is on the superior man? And she said, it's two aisles over there in the fiction section. And if you didn't get that, it is fiction. Men are not superior to women. No matter what the world tries to make you think. Right? It is fiction. So when he's lining this out, why are women 
considered weaker? Well, because they came out of Adam. It was all in Adam, but they came out of Adam. So women maybe aren't as strong. Well, some of you guys may have a wife that's stronger than you. God bless you. I do. But they're more sensitive. They're more in tune to what's going on. They they see things that us guys don't even see. We don't even have any idea about. We're just completely clueless because we're not that way, right? But they see it and they know it. And they feel things that we just don't. Whatever. Yeah. Right. So... It's, it's, it's weaker, but it's weaker in a way. So it's weaker in a way that's good. And sometimes we often find that that is not, uh, that is not what is taught in the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27, Paul talks about this and he said, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That's not saying that men are not foolish because I am very foolish, right? But it is a statement, the foolish to shame the wise. Now, this next statement is important, just as important. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Guys, really, truthfully, being the weaker partner, how many times has she told you something and you went, yeah, sorry. As we talked about yesterday, uh, there is a way that men think is right, that man will think is right. There's a way, but it's wrong. <clears throat> and I told everybody, go home and say that to your wife when you're folding the towels and you're like, she's, what did you do? There's a way, it says in the Bible, that men will think it's right. See what kind of, uh, no, nobody got that? Okay. It's Father's Day. We always, we all might as well just be uh, acting like uh, we're just here till we get to the barbecue, right? What does every father want for Father's Day? Or tacos? It's Texas. Come on. To choose the place to eat. <clears throat> Well, there's a category. <laughs> and Mother's Day is different. What would you like? Father's Day is more about this is what we're going to do. And uh, that coming from my wife. <clears throat> this is how we're going to do it. So uh, the weak things to, of the world to shame the strong. In this sense, that is saying it's an honor to be a weak thing, right? Nobody nobody thinks so? It is. It is an honor to be used in that way. We don't need to be right all the time. We don't need to be first all the time in the race. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, the man said, the man said, this is Adam speaking, right? After the woman came out. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man will leave his father and his mother and is united to his wife. They will become one flesh. So, the world wants us to stay separate, wants us to say, when you say that word weak, I'm not weak, when the women, I, or we're less, we're not, we're equal. God designed us to come together, to be one flesh once again, to work together as teams, right? And we have to, we have to think about that. Actually, in a relationship with your husband and wife, when you do something, you don't do anything by yourself. If you go buy a brand new car and you come home or truck and you say, hey, that's what we did, then I bought it. 
Man, you're going to be in trouble, right? You should expect to be in trouble because all decisions are done together. You can't do it separate like that. You're just going to make trouble for yourself, right? This is proof that the two come together There's one. One is going to be weaker in a sense, but more sensitive on the other side. And, and you can see if we study this story out, which we're not going to do right now, but we study this story out when they, when the woman came out of Adam, Adam was missing something and she was missing something. Because God is the center of that thing, right? So it's an incredible story that man could not make up. So God uses the weaker thing to confound the wise or the strong. We talked about wisdom with the guys yesterday. We talked about it on Thursday night, and it means gray hair, pretty much, which is, which is kind of funny. So it means that it's with experience that you get wisdom, right? Men, women can have for it, ask for it when decisions are being made. And I say to to ask for it when you're reading God's Word. It will help you every time, amen? So the second thing is, they were the last to the cross. And, and when I say that, I mean, well, let's just read it. In 27, verse 55, it says, Many women were there watching from the distance. They followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. In that, they were there through and watched the entire thing. They were the last to leave the cross area. They saw everything. They felt everything. And I want to say that to say this is the reason why I believe God used them is because in the, in the deepest, and I'm going to say this and ladies, I know you're going to get it. In the deepest of sorrows, out of that comes the greatest of joys. Amen? When you've been down and just, well, I don't know where this is going to be, and then all of a sudden that thing is behind you and you are on fire, happy, wow, right? And, and, and one thing that, there was an astronaut, my, uh, astronaut, Mike, uh, Michael Collins, and I was going to print it and put it up, but he made a quote. He became, after he, was an astronaut. Some of you may know of him. He's a little older, but uh, he became a, a linguist studying language and words and things. And in that, he wrote a comment that said that men speak 2,000, 20,000 words a day. And women speak 30,000 words a day. And that, that makes sense, Right? So we could take, we could say, okay, that's why God told the women to go do this, right? But what he said was, I speak my 20,000 words at work. And my wife starts her 20,000 words when I get home, or her 30,000 words when I get home. So <clears throat> in that, if you, there was no phones. You know, there was no TV, there was no telegraph, there was none of that stuff. Pony Express, so there's no way to tell. So what do you tell the women? So does that mean the fastest way to get the news around is to tell a woman? No. I was leading you that way. Yeah. Telegraph, telecast. Our little, our little one. She used to tell on everybody and tell everything. Uh, so, I believe because of the deep 
sorrow that they had, the great joy was blessed onto them to proclaim this message. The greatest news in the world. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was just given willy nilly. Oh, they're standing here. I'm going to tell them. It was a plan. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, so, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. That gives me comfort, right? They had been mourning and mourning. And if Connie was here, she would quote her favorite scripture. But what comes? Joy comes in the morning. Joy on this Easter Sunday that we're reading about. On this day when Christ is risen. So three is the, is the toughest one. Well, I want one more scripture from that. Uh, in Psalms uh, 34, verse 17 through 18. The righteous cry out. And the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to those, uh, to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Hope. And that's what I see that these women are. They are crushed in spirit. They are crying out. And, and remember, Jesus said, while they were all there, and he was on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was everyone. Nobody remembered, as the angel said, he's going before you in Galilee. They went to the tomb because he was dead. They didn't believe that they were going to the tomb. Before they got there, they didn't know what was going to be happening. They went there because he was dead. They wanted to anoint his body. So I believe that the message came to the woman because of this message. In uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals and the Lord God that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say... You must not eat from any of the trees in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit, eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to her, to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when a woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and, and also desirable, to gain wisdom, she took some, ate it, and also gave it to her husband who was there with her, and he ate. So, God is a redeeming God. Why would I talk about that? God is a redeeming God. I believe sin came into the world through a woman. So now the announcement of life comes in to a woman. Because God is a redeeming God. So these women get this message to go forward that life now in Christ. We live in Christ. He has risen. The greatest news in the world. In this garden, death came in by women. In this garden, life was the message that was announced by women. 
Now, see, the angel was there, right? And and here's the thing. He rolled the stone away and sat on it. The angel could have gone forth. If I was God, I would have said, angel, go and tell those men over there. Right? But that's just how God acts. Just what God does. He He made a redeeming line in there, said, you go. Right? Reminds me of messages that are told so often the birth of Christ. Light came into the world through a woman, right? All of you that are fathers, you can't be a father lest there's a woman. But God has made life come from women. Is this a Mother's Day deal on Father's Day? No. This is the perfect time for the resurrection. Women are important, very important to us. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And that's just exciting to me because that's what her name is, living. And that's what happened. That when the garden, when the curse came, as you give birth now, it's like God said, okay, you guys uncovered this stuff, now you see it, I'm not going to tell you how it works, you go figure it out. But multiply. Yeah. It's amazing how He does things, amen? In Luke chapter 2, Verse 6 through 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and wrapped him in cloth and placed him in the manger because there was no guest room available for them. And then you have the shepherds. The angel came to the shepherds and the shepherds came. They understood what was going on because when they found a lamb that was spotless and and ready for sacrifice, they would wrap it. They would swaddle it in a cloth and they would lay it in the manger so now it can't get anywhere and hurt itself until it was taken away to be sacrificed. That's an amazing picture. She already... She did that. God set that up. That happened. So light, the light of the world came in through woman. Now, this message. For number four here is uh, the greatest love brings the greatest privilege. The greatest love brings the greatest privilege. Uh, you know, fathers are awesome and they love their kids, but the love of a mom is the greatest love. I mean, dads are great, but dads also too, and me being one, even in the church, a guy comes to me and says, hey, this is going on and this is this is happening and and I really feel like this, and this is really going wrong here, and I don't know what to do, and I'm so sad, and I'm so down, and I go, well, wait a minute. Scripture says like this, buck it up, buddy, get going. What are you doing? Quit messing around in that thing. Get on to what God wants. Easy, right? That's the way men talk to each other. That's the way we deal with each other. But you have to have women in that great love sometimes all the time to hug on somebody, to sit with somebody, to, to, to care more for people than just give them some scripture and go, come on, dust it off, boy, get out there, get to work, you know, bite that tree, go and hit it, rub some dirt on it, all the stuff guys say, you know, the greater love. So because they had been 
ministering to Christ. If we go back to verse uh, 55 in Matthew 27, it says, Many women were there watching from a distance, and they had followed him from Galilee to care for his needs. There was a ministry that these women had, right? And uh, it talks even more about that. Uh, we can get even further into that if we look at uh, John chapter 20. Verse 14 through 18. Nope, wrong one, but I'll go with it. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And, she, and he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Probably a hundred and ten pounds, right? And a two hundred pound dead body. I'm, I'll get him. I'll do it. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, Mary, has he ever called your name? Man, he wants to call your name. He turned towards her and cried out in uh, Arabic, Rabbani, 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 Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me. The perfect comment that you would say to a woman, right? Because what's she going to do? Grab on to him. Men are going to go. She's going to want to go after and hug him. Don't. <clears throat> for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I have ascend I am ascending to my father, your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said. Uh, these things, what he had said, these things to her. So, that's her message. I have seen the Lord, and he gave me instructions for you guys. What's our message? What's our message supposed to be? I have seen the Lord. And this is what he wants. This is what he wants you to do. This is what he wants. <clears throat> no? In 56, there's another picture here I want to show you. In, in verse 56 of chapter 27, among them are Mary Magdalene, a single woman. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Okay, so you know she's a mother. She also could be a widow too because we can't find any information about her husband, if he was passed away, if he was, what happened. But it states that she's a mother. And then the mother of Zebedee's sons. So she's a wife. So all three of them that Matthew puts in here is the embodiment of womanhood. Representing every aspect of womanhood that this message goes to. That's pretty cool. That's no accident. That's no accident, I don't think. In Mary Magdalene, uh, we remember she was, she was uh, possessed by demons and he healed her. And if you think about what happened, he healed her. And she followed him from that time on. What the disciples he didn't ever heal the disciples. He peeled the disciples because men are like that. We have to be, we have to get stuff taken off of us. We have to be peeled. Women also too, but men even more. You can, you can show something to a woman. They can find out it's true and then you cannot change that. Right? And if you don't, 
If you don't believe me about that, say something wrong and then try to correct yourself to your wife. <clears throat> no, don't go looking for fights. Don't do it. So we see the mother, the single woman, and the wife in this representation. And another reason why I think they, that they, these women, they hung in there, right? Where's the disciples? Where are they at? Yeah, they're scattered. They were afraid. They were gone. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to watch it. Whatever it was, the women were right there. They hung out with him. They hung out as he was hanging on the cross. They're coming to attend to his body. Uh, they stayed and, and uh, ride or die. Right? Faithful. In 55, it says that they, in of Matthew 27, it says that, uh, that they followed him from Gal Galilee and, and, and cared for his needs. Now, I'm going to open this up a little bit. And uh, this might make some people uncomfortable. That's Scripture. So we're going to go ahead and go with it. They ministered to the Lord. In the King James, I believe it says that. They were ministering to the Lord. Uh, that word, ministering to the Lord, is decone. D-I, somebody's writing it down. D-I-A-C-O-N-E-C. Decone. Something like that. Pretty close. Right? It's how we get our word deacon. It's where we get our word deacon. Or servant is a derivative of that also. We've been talking in the men's group on Thursday nights about that. Deacons has a section. We're going to go over a little bit of that section. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. Uh, it says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Kazu and the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping support them out of their own means. Helping support them out of their own means. When you look at that phrase, helping support them out of their own means, what does that mean? What that means is with their own finances with their own uh, skills and and with their own energies on their own time they would come they they didn't sleep out in the wilderness from what i find they would come to where they were they would travel to the where they were to meet their needs whatever that was to to bring clothes to bring food to bring supplies to them okay as they went they were uh, serving the Lord. Deaconesses, as you would call it, is that if that's even a word, okay? And uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 1 through 2, we find uh, one spoken of. <clears throat> it says, uh, I commend to you our sister 
not from friends. A deacon of the church of... And I ask you to receive her and the Lord in the way worthy of His people and give to her any help she may need from you. For she has been a benefactor for many people, including me. So she's going into this church area. Now, she's not, she's a helper. She's going into this church area. She has a task that's been given to her. So help her with the things that she may need to complete the task. Right? Do we understand that right? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Now, and this is a section that we get into. Right before this, we talk about overseers, which is elders. Then we talk about deacons and what deacons must be. And this is the third section. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, must manage his children by his household well, and those have served well, gain excellent standing, and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. This is about the men. And then the next section we get into is Timothy chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. When it, when it talks about this, it's talking about how women, when it says wives, uh, it's not a, uh, when it says women are to be deacons or, or can be deacons or women are part of being deacons, it's not a woman that's possessed. The word is, an, a, a, is like not a wife of a man. It, so a woman can be, can have a spot as a servant in a church, right? Well, this is what he was talking about here. And with, with widows, no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she's over 60 and has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, hospitality uh, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those who are in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. So women have a place in this thing. Now, washing the feet of the saints? Anybody raising their hands? What does that mean? Caring for, being there to do these types of things for them. Uh, Must have... Brought up children, showing hospitality, helping those who are in trouble, devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. And it it speaks about the age there. Uh, Going further into that, it tells us many things that about how a servant of the Lord should be. Not just a woman, but this can come over as a man too. Right? Men aren't wired this way that well we aren't we don't we don't have the same attributes so we have to do things together now as this church we have elders and we have elders wives we don't have any deacons for men and we don't have any deacons as women so we have a men's group and so as we expand this church as we look at this as we as we enlarge ourselves we're going to need help in the children's ministry and all types of things there is things for women to do in the church there is things for men to do in the church these two positions of being deacons aren't positions that come up here and deliver messages they aren't positions that are uh, overseeing all the finances. They aren't positions of those. Those are, are clearly stated as overseers. But the deacon part of it is someone stepping forward and say, I want to serve the Lord in the Lord's house with everything that I have. What does that mean? 
calling up ladies, right? Calling up guys, going, having lunch with people, having breakfast with people, going to people's houses, meeting the needs of the people, right? So, I open that invitation. If there is any any of you ladies or men, I always say the men, go to Jody. I didn't ask him ahead of time, but go to Jody and talk about it. If you, if you desire a position of being a deacon. And for the women, go to Deborah. If it's on your heart to help out in any way, to be a part of things, that doesn't mean that you get a key and you have to be here every time the doors are open. That just means that you'll get a de- designated area that you serve in. And it'll be the area that you will strive in or that you need to strive in. And God will assign those things. Does anybody believe that? Is that crazy? Why would we want to do anything more than what we already do? We come here on Sunday. Now, other other ways that God used woman in, in John chapter 4, uh, verse 39 through 42, you can read that on your own time. I didn't give it to them. But you have the woman at the well. Beautiful message. One of the, one of the first uh, evangelistic messages that Jesus gave as a crossed message. He was a going only to the Jews. Now here's a Samaritan woman, which is a, a Jews that mixed in with everybody else, the Samaritans. So now he comes to her and he tells, he reads her mail. He told me everything about me. He told me everything I did. He said, you know, you don't have just one husband. You've had five. And the one you're with now is not even your husband. She was like, wow. Right? So she ran into that town and told that message. So what happened? Many Samaritans came out to to hear what Jesus had to say. She was a servant at that point. She she found the truth and she went and told about it. She used her uh, extra 10,000 words. If you guys know me, I'll talk a lot here, but go home or go somewhere with me and her. She talks all the time. I don't tell. I don't say much. That's planned ahead of time. The less I say, the less I have to be corrected. Correct? Yes. No, I can get in trouble no matter what. I don't have to say anything to get in trouble. I know where everything goes, and sometimes I just move it out of place. So when when we're looking at this, we, we see that, that God has used these women to deliver this message and... Uh, I just want to tell you that if you think that serving the church in any way, well, here's a couple of things real quick. I wrote them down so they're not, it's just early this morning I wrote them down. There's a couple of ways that you can see, you can gauge, and I used to ask these questions a lot. And so I'm going to start. When you, if you haven't heard me ask you this question, get ready. Because it's on, it's on my tongue now. It's on my mind. What's God telling you lately? So here's the thing that tells you you're really not engaged and you're really not plugged in. If you go, well, you're not really telling me anything. I don't know. There's another reply. I don't know. Or you say, it's so noisy up there. I have no idea. Anybody could say anything and I might not get it. That means that means you're 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 a little bit off. You're standing off a little bit from what actually is going on. You press in because it, it, the more that you are around God's people, the more excited you get about what He's doing. The more we that's why we do the testimony time. The more you learn, the more you want to learn. 
right? Here's another one. What's God doing? Huh? What do you mean, what's God doing? There should always be, people will tell you, you walk into a church and they'll say, you, we used to, we used to see it all the time. You walk into a church and we'd go around moving around churches and they'd say, okay, well, let's have some testimonies. To me, testimonies are not like this. So, Jimmy would run to the front and go, and hand him a mic. My testimony, when I was seven years old, the preacher was talking about fire and going to hell, and I walked down the aisle, and I gave my life to the Lord, and I got baptized that day, and it was April 29th, 19... That's not a testimony. I mean, that's a testimony, but your testimony should be what God did this week, what he did today, what he's doing now. That's a testimony. And a true testimony should change someone. Really. When you tell your testimony, that should, that should, to someone else is going through that type of thing. They should hear that and, and they can go, man, that reminds me of mine and want to tell it, right? It's contagious. Consuming fire. Get in close so it'll eat you up. So, with these two questions, uh, if your reply is, I don't know, I don't, you know, eh. My grandson says, grandson says, meh. Uh, plug in. Plug in, because we know from this story, God is not dead. It is Sunday now. It's not Friday anymore. It's Sunday now. He is not dead. And I want to look at this. He left, or how they left the tomb. Right? In verse 7. Of 28. It says, go and quickly tell the disciples. <clears throat> he is raised from the dead and he is going ahead of, into Galilee. That thing they forgot. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Afraid, yet filled with joy. Man, have you ever been really afraid? I mean, really afraid. Like somebody's knocking on the door, I'm home alone, and they got a big gun and a big dog, and they're coming in for me. I mean, afraid. Heart pounding, afraid. Imagine that with the unspeakable, screaming, top of your lungs, joy on top of that. I've never felt it. I know I can't explode. I've a couple of times, is the Lord, do, if He blesses me anymore, I'm going to pop. Really, I've felt that. I don't know if that's it, but man... They left with great joy. In Mark's gospel, it says, trembling or trembled and amazed. They left trembled and amazed instead of fear and joy. It would be amazing. It would be completely amazing. And if you read John's gospel, it was like, okay. And then turn around and bam, there's the gardener. Hey! And that's Jesus. And he says, Mary! Yeah, you would be, you would be ready to pop. You would be so excited. You know, like, uh, Richard Pryor in the, in the woods. And he says, snake. And so and he runs, bam, tree. You'd be running blind, just running to get out of there. Some of you, would a mouse would be better, right? Run from a mouse, jump up on the counter, 
you can't jump all day long and try never try to be able to jump on the counter and a mouse comes across the floor. Boom. Fear and trembling. Psalms chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate His rule with trembling. That explains it to me. Fear and reverence for God and how great and big and vast that He is and then yet how small He can be and how small you may think, oh, this problem is so little. He loves the details. He loves a small thing just as a big thing. Amen? Kiss His Son. Wow. Kiss His Son. <clears throat> or He will be angry. And your way will lead to your destruction. For His wrath can flare up in any moment. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. Take refuge in the Lord today. If you're standing outside and you're going, I don't really know, I don't know, I don't really have time, hey, take time. Take refuge in Him. Start little and it'll grow. It'll get bigger. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. God is not dead. And I want to tell you, this body, this church, is not dead. If you feel you want to do more, then say something. Because the only way that you can do more is if you say something. And it's okay. I mean, I had to learn how to say no. And that was really hard for me. Because, you know, actually, truthfully, in the world, when you're pleasing people, you're not pleasing God. Uh, everything that ever anybody say, hey, I need this on my car. I need that happen. I need this on my house. I, yep, 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 yep. It got to where I was never around my wife. At first, she was happy, but then soon she said, hey, look, I miss you. You're never here anymore. You're never around. You're always doing something for somebody. Didn't win any, didn't win anything in heaven. Didn't get me any closer to God actually probably drew me further away because it was about me until it wasn't. God is good. So fathers, the best present you ever had, this father, our father, best present he ever had, birth of his son, death of his son, Resurrection of His Son. And some of us have sons and daughters who are away from the Lord, doing stupid things out in the world, acting idiots. And we, right now, today, I want to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our children as a father. I want to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our mothers as a husband and as a son. And I want to plead it over our brothers and sisters as a brother. Lord, as we leave this place, I plead Your blood over our right ear our right thumb, and our right toe so that we hear and do and walk in Your way. Lord, I know that things are afoot. I know <clears throat> that the enemy is looking to devour things, but I know that Sunday is here and You're risen. And let us take forward that message that we have seen the Lord in the face of our brother. 
We have seen the Lord when we look out and see the mountains, when we see the animals, when we see anything. We see you, Lord, and let us just go forward and tell everyone, I have seen the Lord, and He is here to meet you, and He is there to meet you. Father, I pray for all those who are have turned away from You, Lord. All those who have slid back, fell black, back, whatever You want to call it, Lord. I just pray for them now to turn as Mary did. And that You cry out their name. And they receive Your message. And they receive You. And that they turn and turn, and turn, and go, and tell that they've seen you. Father, bless us this week. Protect us in all ways. In Jesus Christ, our Savior's name, we ask these things, and all the church said, Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you were blessed. If you have any questions, please give us a call, 682-327-7082. We are at 7955 Reed Road in Azle, Texas. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?